before I go into the settlement agreement itself, I wanted to answer the three questions from the law before Justice Popperwell. As a preliminary submission, the relative complexity or simplicity of a settlement with a third party cannot be determinative of whether it is raised into areas ACTA. Otherwise, a claimant could, by the device of entering a Byzantine settlement agreement, enhance its judgment sum by excluding the settlement agreement from the analysis. In that context, I answer the three questions as follows. Question one, should the court or a court quantify by reference to a settlement figure now or later? In the abstract, generally a court should do the best it can to quantify finally the relevant damages at trial. As to our facts, there was no serious suggestion below from MCM that the court should do anything other than choose between, on the one hand, the full 284 million, or on the other hand, are figures in confidential annex four that I've handed up using the settlement figure as the starting point. Okay. If I may show your lordships, please, the oral closings from the final day again, supplemental tab 20. Picking up at page 141. We are now in uh, my learned friend's reply oral closing on day 17. Line 24, this day says, my lord, the final point I wish to deal with was the settlement agreement from this morning, I think. As I understand the position, my lord, our primary position is you're not interested in the settlement agreement at all. It doesn't come into consideration. That, of course, remains their position and was what the judge agreed. But if that is wrong, as I understand the position with the parties, we are on common ground that your start point is the figure, the payment amount figure from that settlement agreement. And we would accept that you take off from that figure the amounts we have recovered from the other defendants with whom we've settled in these proceedings. And that's the um, 1.8 million, which is mentioned in the judgment in aggregate. I do not accept that we would have to give credit for any notional profit that might have been made under the sub-sale, which has now come to nothing. That's the seven million. Um, and then, in circumstances where, therefore, we say the understanding was the judge was being given a menu with two options. Two we do need to look at what he went on to say. Line well, we 14. do. And I, I, I was just, before we do, I was saying, at that point, the judge was being given, we say, a menu of two options, 284 million or our annex four as handed up. And then my lady friend said this, but I have an overarching point in relation to that settlement agreement. And firstly, it is that it is a highly complex document, as you've seen, my lord, and there is no way of telling what the end position is going to be under that document at this present stage. There is also a default provision. If my client is in default under that settlement agreement, then the whole thing is wiped out and we remain liable for the full 284 million figure. Pausing there, it's not a suggestion that they were in default. Uh, as speculation, as it were. And then what clause is that? Clause 3.2a, it's read out. Over the page at line 7, my learned friend picks up. We just don't know how this is going to work out, is the basic point that I'm making to your lordship. What is the consequence of that? It follows from line 9. In those circumstances, that just underlines the point that this should have nothing whatsoever to do with the conspirators in this case, and should certainly not be inuring to their benefit. That is the point which we say is a non sequitur, which is that because the settlement agreement is complicated and has contingencies, it must therefore be raised into a sector. What is absent from here is any alternative case on the part of MCM that says if you're against us on raising into a sector, and so we're not starting with 284 million profit, the answer is not provided by Mr. Lewis's Annex 4 calculations. It's much more complicated. Here is our alternative claim. And so 
Here we're dealing with the point that wasn't advanced by MCM below. Yes, in the abstract, one may have claims where the liability is not just uh, quantified by a single figure, but in terms, before the judge, it was not saying, if you're against us on the matter of principle, then you must go higher than the settlement sum subject to the adjustments for pre-trial settlement recoveries and, albeit disputed, the profit. So we do say that the menu remains, remains then two choices for the judge, and that's reflected in the judgment. And to that, we are now seeking to add a third choice, the menu, and that's my new point. But what we say isn't on the menu, at least unless my learned friend now says it is, is a fourth choice, which is in between 284 million and the settlement figure based on further contingencies in the settlement. Question two, as to... Um, now, that, that submission goes to whether there should be a different figure, as it were, on the, on the menu of choices, as, as distinct from whether it is something to be regarded as avoiding the loss or reduced radio factor or whatever. Yes, but I, I hoped I had answered um, the first point, which is a theme running through all three questions, with my preliminary observation, which is the complexity of the settlement agreement, and, and that subsumes potential contingencies that might be contained therein, cannot itself be determinative of whether it's raised in Trello's actor or not. Otherwise, there's a device for claimants to uh, exclude from analysis through such complexity the settlement agreements. Yes, and I follow that, but um, assume to which of these, uh, you know, which of my Lord's questions and your answers to them go to which point. So the first one you've been dealing with goes to whether there's an alternative figure table, um, and you're coming now to uh, the remaining questions, which um, may go to whether um, the settlement agreement is to be regarded as reduced radio factor at all. Uh, well, we, we don't ac accept they do, um, for the reasons I'll explain. Uh, and they're exemplified by um, how one, one should approach the question. Um, question two, if one takes into account um, the latter, i.e. developments beyond the settlement figure, how does that depend upon any subsequent agreements? As to subsequent amendments to the, a settlement agreement, if they're pre-trial, then they should be taken into account. If they're post-trial, then strictly they will be irrelevant if the trial judge quantifies the loss as at trial, which is what should generally occur. But as a general point, a claimant can't, having settled for X, then later agree to amend its settlement agreement to pay X plus Y without an inquiry as to whether Y can then also be claimed from the defendant. But we say that none of this is relevant in circumstances where there's no suggestion that there's anything other than the two choices that were on the menu before the judge. It, on any view, we are dealing with um, the terms by which MCM agreed with ANZ to compromise the liability, which for the reason this morning is the way in which one assesses their loss. And therefore, one has to look at those terms and do the best one can to quantify that loss as at trial. But that's all in the abstract, because the reality is it was just binary as between the figure my learned friend gave or our figure, if you're with me on the question of principle. Your, your figure being, in fact, an artificial one, because it treats it as though it only had the delta figure. But you say artificial uh, in favour of the claimant, so we don't have to worry. Uh, yes. And, and question three, um, how does it work if 
the settlement agreement or settlement figure depends in part on later recoveries. Again, that's theoretical here because there's no case that one should have a bolt on to the <coughs> calculations we've given um, for later recoveries. That was a case that could have been advanced by MCM in the alternative if it saw fit, but it didn't. The judge had two choices. Um, but subject to MCM now wishing to do that, one would then have to have a detailed analysis of the sums that could flow to ANZ in contradistinction to those that would be retained by MCM, and we say, therefore, would be a windfall, in summary, um, if the <coughs> judgment sum were upheld to reflect them. But how, how would it work conceptually? Suppose you had a settlement agreement uh, under which uh, it, uh, it said, uh, uh, we, MCM, will you pay you, ANZ, half of what we recover in the current litigation. How then would that work if we were to have to decide what the measure of recovery in the present litigation is by reference to a sum so defined? Well, um, <coughs> the premise would be to assume full enforcement. That's always the premise of the court damages assessment. And therefore, one would feed that in. So if, say, the um, relevant sum was £100 that was claimed, and that was the settlement, so the claimant's loss is to be assessed by reference to its liability to the third party. The claimant, as a starting point, was saying £100, but it has then settled for 50% of whatever it recovers from the defendant. The answer would be £50, because insofar as the claimant was entitled to recover the full £100 and then retain £50 and passing £50 on to the third party, the claimant would then have recovered more than its loss, its loss being the liability to the third party of £50. So one would feed the percentage into the maximum possible sum, and that would provide the answer. And, and this is all in a context where we don't suggest that <coughs> the, um, it's a condition precedent to the claimant recovering from the defendant that the claimant have actually paid the third party. I'm not following that. It's my, it's my fault. Then. But but let let, that's let me try it with some simple numbers because um, it, it, so it, it, it may may be simple. Suppose the liability is the liability to ANZ is two hundred million. Let's assume for a moment, and the settlement agreement says uh, that uh, in the full and final settlement of that liability, you. MCM agree to pay half of what you uh, recover from straight. So, on your analysis, the initial loss was the liability to ANZ. That has now disappeared in total, and it's been replaced by uh, a sum which has to be paid, which is a function of how much is recovered from straights. If you say the amount that must be recovered from straights is that sum, how, how do you set it? We, you, um, because it's the payment sum, which, which on this analysis is the loss now. It's the, it's the sum which has to be paid under the settlement agreement, which is the loss. You, you've set it as a function of the, the 200 million starting point, but, 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 which was the potential ceiling on the liability. Why? Why? Well, the, I don't understand that. The, the 200 is before the settlement. Yes. ANZ are claiming 200. That's how I understood the example. Right. And then MCM settles with ANZ for 50% of what it recovers from come harvest, say. Um, in those circumstances, if the judgment was for 200 against come harvest, then MCM would only have to pass 100 to ANZ. In those circumstances, MCM would retain 100. Therefore, the maximum 
loss that MCM can recover is the 50% figure, percentage in its settlement agreement, as compared to the original assumed liability of 200 million, i.e. 100 million. But if it recovers 100 million, it only has to pay 50 million. And if it recovers 25 million, it only has to pay 12 and a half million. Well, and when you say, well, what does it recover? Your answer is, you can only tell by asking how much it has to pay in the settlement agreement. So that's its loss in one of the cases. Well, that may be the way one applies the settlement agreement, but then that was, with respect, it's not what, I mean, it's theoretical. It's well, I know, I, know, I know it's theoretical, although we may have to look more carefully at the extent to which the payment amount is dependent on recoveries in this settlement agreement. But the reason I'm exploring it is because you may, by way of concession, essentially say, well, you don't need to go into all that because we're prepared to assume that the payment amount is the delta figure. But if that's an artificial concession, it may cast light on whether this can properly be described as, uh, as, as something which isn't collateral. It, it is an artificial figure, at least in this sense, that one of the deductions from the headline delta figure is the amount of recoveries made from uh, including your, a number of people, including your clients. Well, that's right, but that, that was the point against us, and we aren't taking it. So we say you can, one can take 200. But yes, but that doesn't work, because another way of looking at this agreement is, is that the delta figure, the payment amount, let's call it that, is, is something that is kicked down the road. It's currently 2025. That may be the result of amendments, but what is to happen in the meanwhile is, is that the parties agree, I think it's clause four, that they, it is in their interest to maximise recovery from the real villains of the piece, which includes your client, um, and that they will each take steps, including MCM taking steps, um, to sue anybody they think they can sue, uh, and that any recoveries uh, will, after deduction of costs, be paid over to ANZ. So, and that's, and that's a contractual obligation which MCM undertakes. So their contractual obligation to ANZ is to maximize the recoveries. Um, and if by the maturity date, which is a long way down the road, uh, they haven't fully indemnified ANZ for their loss, then they will instead pay the um, payment amount figure uh, which takes a figure and then makes certain deductions from it. Now that's a rather different way of looking at what the deal is than simply treating it as an agreement to pay something less than the 291 million. And that could be regarded, couldn't it, as, um, uh, and this is, a, this is a quote from a case called Mobile and BJ Pipe and Valve Company, you might want to look at, simply a reorganisation of the terms upon which these two parties were or were not going to conduct litigation against the real defendants. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful and I, I will look at that authority and come back on it. Um, what we do, do say is that on our facts, um, using the 200 million is a concession to that extent because it jumps ahead to the maturity date rather than looking at anything in terms of reorganisation prior to that date. Um, and what we say in relation to the um, point that um, taking half will go into a spiral that reduces downwards each time the recovery is that um, in circumstances where, as I say, the judgment sum would then be 100 million. If only 50 million has to be passed on to ANZ, then that itself is a consequence of a mistake that's been made in negotiating the transaction in that way. It's not dissimilar to what happened in Swinson and Lowick Rose, where the answer wasn't the answer the claimant want because of the way in which the reorganization had been done in relation to the refinancing. But what I do say is that, um, although that isn't straightforward, um, the alternative solution 
isn't correct because the alternative solution is to say on that example MCM recovers the full 200 million from come harvest it only has to give 100 million to ANZ it is therefore 100 million better off than it ever would have been absent the fraud um, absent the fraud it would have made its cut of 7 million as it is on that simple analysis it's um, retained 100 million that it would not otherwise have had and the overriding compensatory principle has therefore been offended so I do say uh, that's a reason why that type of example is problematic but I, I don't accept that that example reflects this case or certainly reflects this case when we've conceded that one can just take the 200 million figure um, I think I've answered all three questions um, in the way I wanted to I did want to go into the detail of the settlement agreement if time permits um, and now in the context of part two which um, is obviously a twofold purpose for me first to advance the no loss point but also to justify why I'm entitled or should be entitled to advance the, the no loss point um, and I would ask your lordships please to look at the settlement agreement um, alongside the redacted version so one can see the relative impact of the redaction and the redacted version one has in the supplemental bundle at tab 6 So starting with the confidential document, um, on confidential A3, one has the parties defined separately as EDF M and MCM. Um, recital B is MCM's relevant loss of 291 million. Recitals C and D are the assertions of ANZ's claim against MCM that MCM are liable for breach and or to repay the sums paid to MCM and or to indemnify or compensate the ANZ parties so wide enough to cover the contractual claim the restitutionary claim as debated this morning recital E is the non-admission of liability by MCM and others also mentioned this morning and I, I do accept that all these recitals are always patent to straight if one then turns in the supplemental bundle to page 25 please and so were these, were these in the previous version yes the recitals the recitals are all a patent pages 23 and 24 in the supplemental bundle And it's when we get to page is 25 and 26 that the redaction, other than from the contents table, begin. Um, one has clause 3.1, which is the mutual release. Uh, that was always visible. And then one has clause 4.1a. As identified, it places the payment obligation on EDFM to pay ANZ. Um, but a number of problems mean that it, it cannot, we say, be understood in context without the removal of the redaction. First of all, there are two definitions in there, the payment amount and the maturity date, which were themselves redacted until the Saturday before the trial. So yes, the uh, obligation <coughs> being one on EDFM is there, but one can't understand the sentence as a whole without seeing the definitions which were concealed. Secondly, the immediately following subclause of clause 4.1, still part of the subheading payment, not for interpretation purposes, but for purposes of what one is unable to see, was redacted. We see that at the top of supplemental bundle, page 26. And thirdly, 
the clause following clause 4.2, which is all still under the heading payment obligation for clause 4, is redacted. And that we later see is clause 4.3. So even within clause 4, the majority was redacted. Next one has these clause 8, which is on confidential A8 and also on supplemental page 27. And here it says, the parties agree that save in the case of fraud by EDFM group company, the aggregate maximum cash sum payable under or in connection with the agreement by the EDFM parties to ANZ shall be an amount equal to the total of the relevant loss plus any amount payable in accordance with 11.2 and 19.7. One could always see that, but um, to understand it in context was not possible with the redactions. And notably, it refers to sums payable by the EDFM parties, i.e. not just EDFM, but also MCM. It refers to clause 11.2, and if one turns on to page 29 of the supplemental bundle, one sees that 11.2 was redacted. That's under the heading duties of the parties begging the question of whether any relevant duties fell on MCM. In the event, when we look at the unredacted version, we see that clause 11.2 does impose a payment obligation on MCM uh, because it says the EDFM parties, 11.2a, i.e. both EDFM and MCM, shall promptly reimburse ANZ for all costs and disbursements incurred. But we, we couldn't see that previously. And in the event, no consequential cost claim has been pursued there. Clause 12 then has, as was always visible on supplemental page 30, a clawback provision. If at any time following the relevant time, a definition that was unknown with the redactions, the total ANZ receipts exceed the relevant loss, a definition that was unknown, ANZ shall pay to EDFM an amount equal to the excess over the relevant loss. So while that was not redacted, the, the definitions that explained it were. Then if we stay in the supplemental bundle, there follow many pages of complete redactions, as will have been seen, obscuring all of clauses 13 to 17, right up to page 40. And one then gets to the confidentiality provision of clause 18. Clause 19.6. Next, please. So supplemental 43, or if we're in the confidential, it's page 25. All amounts payable by the EDFM parties under or in connection with this agreement, including the payment amount, should be paid in full, etc. So again, an umbrella provision suggesting that payment obligations did fall, not just on EDFM, but also on MCM, begging the question of what the latter obligations were. <coughs> Clause 21, never redacted, supplemental 45, provides that the EDFM parties shall be jointly and severally liable for the obligations of MCM. Again, an umbrella term 
presupposing <coughs> relevant obligations of MCM rather than EDFM under the agreement. And then if we come please to page 48 of the supplemental bundle, we get to Schedule 1, Interpretation. As your Lordship will know from experience, one of the most important clauses in construing any agreement like this is the definitions clause, the interpretation clause, here it is. But we have five pages of definitions, all of which are excluded, except for, on page 52, recoveries, and then on page 53, uh, relevant loss which we've already seen from recital B anyway, and just means 291 million. In particular, it obscures, of course, the definition of payment amount, which is at confidential page 33. So we do say, straits cannot sensibly have been expected to plead a case on the settlement agreement without sight of, of the redacted portions of this document, which remained redacted until the eve of the trial. And MCM are wrong to suggest in their skeleton at paragraph 42.2 that the redacted version disclosed all relevant clauses. Clearly there were relevant clauses that were obscure. And we do say that when one sees the agreement as a whole, MCM has not proven any loss because the relevant liability fell upon EDFM and exclusively on EDFM. By that you mean the liability under Clause 4, do you? Yes. So that the other references to uh, sums which may be due from the EDF and MAN parties ought to be ignored because you, as a matter of concession, say uh, you're prepared to take the delta B. Uh, no, it's well, not that they're ignored, because we very much rely upon the payment amount definition. But what we do say in the context of them being redacted is that there is no basis on which any case could have been put forward properly or with confidence as to the outcome of this agreement until the redactions were removed. Yeah, sorry, let me put it another way. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're more familiar with this document than, than I am, but uh, it, it seemed to be part of the way you were going through it, referring to uh, clauses which place an obligation, payment obligation on the EDF and MAG parties, that there were certain aspects of this agreement which obliged MCM not the whole agreement. Uh, why do you say they can't recover those? Uh, they haven't advanced a claim for those. It's, it's the menu point again. That, that they could, potentially, if they had said, Mr Lewis's Annex 4 isn't correct in terms of calculations. Um, if our losses are the losses under the settlement agreement, then the losses are as follows. They would say the payment amount, they say. It's because your Annex 4 essentially accepts the Delta figure subject to the reductions. And, that, and that's the alternative. It's that and the fact that where there are other um, individual payment obligations, for example, in relation to reimbursement of ANZ's costs by the EDFM party, they have not been used to ground any claim. Um, there was no quantum evidence at trial that this is what ANZ has spent what the EDFM parties have to reimburse. The, the consequential loss points weren't pursued. But um, there are two different points here, obviously. There's the, the, the point of substance as to um, whether any loss has been suffered by MCM. But um, when I was focusing upon the redacted provisions that pose, impose obligations on the EDFM parties, I was doing so to show that until one can see the full agreement, one cannot safely put any case that MCM has proven no loss because the only relevant 
obligation? As it turns out, the case you want to put is based solely on Clause 4 in relation to the payment amount. As you say, you couldn't have been expected to put forward that case then, which was in the redacted version, because you hadn't got other provisions. Is that is an unfair way of putting it? No, that's a fair way of putting it. In a context where MCM haven't themselves advanced a case by reference to other aspects of the agreement, having instead put all the eggs in the basket throughout that is, this is irrelevant, this is res neutrality. <coughs> Thank you. Suppose, looking at clause 13.7, suppose judgment was given for the 284 million and was paid by your client the next day. That would have to be paid over being prior to the relevant time, subject to a deduction as set out in 13.701 to ANZ. Would it not? <coughs> the relevant time is defined as when the payment obligation is paid in full. Um, yes, which we know has been put off. Uh, by the recent amendment, um, the maturity date was changed earlier this year to the 2025 date. There was a more complicated provision as to maturity date before trial on which Mr. Dinsmore made submissions that one sees um, in the transcript. But at any rate, it hadn't arrived by the time of the judgment. Um, we didn't know that. That was one of Mr. Dinsmore's complaints, which is that because there hadn't been disclosure of related documents, I see. this settlement agreement, both before and now, refers to lots of other agreements. Because there hadn't been disclosure of related agreements, it wasn't possible to say at that time whether the maturity date had or had not arisen. Um, based on the amendment since the judgment in March, one can now see a clearer maturity date that isn't determined by reference to other agreements, but is instead just a calendar date. And one can now see that that date hasn't arisen. Um, so that's a, a complication. Okay, let's put that to one side. Let's assume it had always been clear that the maturity date and the relevant time is in the future. We haven't got there yet. But if you had paid the judgment sum when it was ordered, subject to the deduction of costs, MCM would be obliged to pass the entirety of that on ANZ, would it not? Well, that's, that's not a case that's ever been put by... Yeah, no, I understand MCM, that. I, I, I understand aware. that. And to, um, Their case is, the, this is so complicated, you can't apply it at all. Um, but I'm just trying to work out how far your argument, how your argument works. Echoing my Lord's point, that is this not just a means of reorganising recoveries by any any of the defrauded parties amongst themselves? Well, one would have to consider the other provisions, for example, the clawback provision, which suggests that, and we were ignorant of the maturity date at the time of the trial, that um, there would be a clawback time when ANZ could be <coughs> reimbursing to EDF men an amount equal to the excess over the relevant loss, the relevant loss being a function of the payment figure. So, no, the relevant loss is the 291 million, isn't it? But if ANZ get managed to recover from you more than 291 million, then they'll give it to um, Sorry. MCF. Let them make their profit, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Uh, um, what we the maturity date amendment has been made since the trial, and we don't know the reason for that. Um, and um, it now makes it Maybe more straightforward. Maybe because permission to appeal was given, for all we know. I I, I won't suggest that because that was in May, and then oh, right. made okay. in March. Um, but um, uh, we don't know how it ties in with the application for permission to appeal that was made to 
the judge below, which might have been anticipated to continue. Um, but putting that to one side, um, we do say that um, if I'm right on the principle that this is not res in terelo sacra, then it was open to my learned friend by way of respondent's notice or otherwise to say, or by way of respondent's notice, the judge reached the right number for <coughs> different reasons than those he gave. Namely, that even if we are going into the settlement agreement, yes. in the end, it's, it's, it's like the, the percentage. But, but your, your position both before a judge and before us, is this is not raised in Trillia Sacta, right? Understand all this. And it produces a lower, the, the figure at which MCM has to compensate, AM said, is lower than 291 million. But it's not obvious to me that it is so in all circumstances. And I've suggested to you circumstances might not be so that if you actually paid over 284 million 14 days after judgment they would have to pay the entirety of that apart from some costs over and said so in other words what, what this I'm trying to understand what this does commercially and one, one way of looking at it is to say we'll both try and sue whoever we can and recover what we can and if we get the money in we'll, we'll pay it MCM, get the money in, we'll pay it to NZ, up until there's a cut-off point. And beyond the cut-off point, at that point, there's a figure, which is the figure in what my law calls the delta figure, which is going to be paid by the parent in any event. And beyond that point, if there's any further recoveries, they're split 50-50. That seems to be what it does. And it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be inconsistent suggestion that there are circumstances and by the time you get to judgment you're still in that world where what is recovered by MCM from the, the fraudsters does get paid over to AMZ and, the, and it's not capped at the delta figure. Your case is it's capped at the delta figure but it doesn't seem to me to be necessarily so. We were still constrained at trial by the lack of. I understand that, but, but now we have the document. We have to decide what we think it does. Well, we still don't have all the documents. <coughs> I mean, we do have now an understanding of the maturity date, and and yes, I, I have to accept that that allows us to to look at clause thirteen point seven more clearly. But I do say that. It, in circumstances where um, on the primary or my part one um, in circumstances where the choice for the judge was binary if but you are, you're now inviting us in this part two you're inviting us to look at this document and see what it does because your point is there's no liability on NCM it's all uh, a liability on the parent and MCM's liability is is settled. Well, part two doesn't have a problem with that because clause 13.7 is also an obligation on EDFM. Well, clause 13.7 con contemplates uh, payment over of what is received by an EDFM party of an EDFM re recovery. Well, the only EDFM party who has a claim is MCM, so it must therefore contemplate receipt by MCM, which will then be handed over in some way to EDFM, the parent company, so that the parent company can make the payment required by clause 13.7. So it, it, um, it assumes that there is some arrangement, although this document doesn't need to tell us what it is, between MCM and EDFM in relation to recoveries in order to enable EDFM to perform its obligation. Well, that's inference from um, the clause that there will be that pass through from MCM to EDFM. But again, there's no evidence on that. And, and that 
we say is why <coughs> MCM hasn't proven its loss in respect of obligations that in terms fall on EDFF. Now, it may be that um, MCM could say one implies that pass-through, and what we would argue about that, but they're not saying that yet. All they're saying is we shouldn't be allowed to run the points at all, and, and I was going to come on to that in a moment. But um, uh, we are um, going back and forth from the part one to part two here, obviously. In, in relation to part one, we maintain that there's no respondent's notice, and therefore this court should adopt the same uh, approach the case by reference to the same binary position as the judge below. It has a menu, the two choices that were offered to the judge. Um, on part two, um, assuming the new point is open to me, which I'm going to come on to in a moment, we do say that it's no different from what I could have said in closing. And were this debate instead with the judge in closing, I would have said not only we don't know when the maturity date is, so we don't know where we stand, but also, as my learned friend Junior did, but also that it's not good enough to assume the pass through from MCM to EDFM. In terms, <coughs> this is an obligation like the clause 4.1 obligation, which falls upon. EDFM. And, and here, to support my application to be allowed to, to go into the no-look point, we are now looking at a clause that was redacted until Saturday the 9th of October. And it's now being suggested that actually, although MCM has not said it, from the bench it's saying well, this, is the, this is their answer to the case. And so that only emboldens, um, we say, our applications to be allowed to take the point. Um, and I will move on to those applications now, if I may. Um, but it was the clause that Mr Dinsmore, I think, said was the critical clause and made submission to that. By the time we got to submissions, we didn't have any difficulty in identifying it as something that was... Uh, that's right, yes, submissions were made about it, and this point wasn't taken. Um, um, as I've said, it was, there was an explicit concession on this clause and on clause 4.1, but we weren't taking the distinction on the separate corporate identity of EDFM and MCF. Um, but the relevant <coughs> counterfactual for the purposes of allowing part two of our case is um, what could have happened differently, and, and that is the point at which events could have happened differently, not some earlier point that would ever have had an impact upon the evidence. Um, so on that, our primary position is that ground three is broad enough to cover our argument that MCM suffered no loss under the settlement agreement. And so for that, one can look, please, at our original appellant's notice, which is in the... Core bundle at tab one. And if one turns, please, to page five, the order challenged on appeal in section five is the order that judgment be entered against the defendant in the amount of 282 million odd. And over the page on page seven, the order which we sought in its place is that the claim against the tenth defendant in unlawful means conspiracy is dismissed. That is the same consequence that follows if MCM has proven no loss because loss is an essential ingredient to the cause of action in tort. So yes, but when you read it together with your grounds, that, that is plainly the consequence of your first two grounds concerned with liability on which you were refused permission to appeal. Well, Straight says that when one looks at ground three on page 14, the chapeau says that the court should have quantified MCM's loss by reference to 
the amount of its liability to ANZ under the settlement agreement. That is neutral as to the amount of that liability. It does not give an alternative figure. It leaves the field open to say that the amount is any particular figure, including in the event zero. As an alternative case, if your lordships are against me, the state has applied for an amendment to the grounds of appeal in light of MCM's skeleton saying this point is off limits. Do we have your uh, 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 skeleton argument for permission to appeal? Uh, yes, that has been put in the supplemental bundle and is <coughs> at supplemental tab 25. Without bothering to go through it all, does it Take this point, the, 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 the no payment point. No. So you have to read the grounds of appeal, don't you, by reference to the argument in the permission? Well, we say the grounds of argument. appeal are, are wide enough unless one reads them as qualified by the skeleton, and we don't suggest that this point was in that skeleton. Well, we're wide enough to if it was a point that wasn't raised, indeed, it was conceded below. Well, if you've conceded a point below, um, surely you've got to identify it and raise it specifically as the point you want to run on appeal. Um, your Lordships have my submissions on the Straits' primary position. In the alternative, we apply to amend the grounds of appeal, and the relevant documents are set out at the end of the supplemental bundle. There, there are strictly two applications. One is for the supplemental skeleton in support of the amendment application, and then the other application is the amendment application itself. Uh, the supplemental skeleton is covered by the application notice at tab 31. My Lord, there's, there's no issue on that. We don't object to the supplemental skeleton. You've probably said the things that were in the supplemental skeleton by now anyway, haven't you? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I was perhaps going to say them if I could. Um, the, the supplemental skeleton itself is at paragraph 30, sorry, tab 30. And will assist the court on the relevant legal test, we say. The application to amend the grounds of appeal, the key documents are, are threefold. The application notice itself, tab 27. The draft amended grounds of appeal, tab 28. And then that supplemental skeleton at <coughs> tab 30. The relevant test, we say, can be found in the Notting Hill Finance and Shape case, which is authorities bundle tab 13, please. And the, in this case, Judge Goldsmark QC on a first appeal had allowed a new point, namely that default interest in a loan agreement was penal which point had not been before the district judge. And the Court of Appeal reviewed the correctness of his decision to allow the new point. And the principles relevant to the exercise of the discretion to allow points on appeal not argued below. That discretion <coughs> is considered on page 269, at paragraphs 21 to 28. There's no dispute that an appellate court has a general discretion whether to allow new points to be taken on appeal. And then at paragraph 23 and 25 respectively, this Justice Snowden, as he then was, refers to the Pitless and Grant and Singh and Das cases. As to the former, at paragraph 23, he refers to court 
approach your justice north, a key theme that runs through both those cases before we read them is analysing whether the trial would have been conducted any differently if the point had been taken earlier. One sees that at the top of page 270. Albeit in the context of a pure point of law, Lord Justice North said, even if the point is a pure point of law, the appellate court retains the discretion to exclude it. But where we can be confident, first, that the other party has had opportunity enough to meet it, secondly, that he has not acted to his detriment on the face of the earlier admission to raise it, and thirdly, that he can be adequately protected in costs, our usual practice is to allow a pure point of law, not raised below, to be taken in this court. Likewise, paragraph 25, Lord Justice Haddon Cave in Singh and Das, under the embedded paragraph 17, accentuating the negative, says, an appellate court will not generally permit a new point to be raised on appeal if that point is such that either it would necessitate new evidence or had it been run below, it would have resulted in the trial being conducted differently. So again, the counterfactual is how would the trial have been conducted differently? Uh, Mr Justice Snowden summarises the principles in paragraphs 26 and 28. At 26, these authorities show that there is no general rule that a case needs to be exceptional. At 27, at one end of the spectrum are cases such as the Jones case, in which there has been a full trial involving live evidence from cross-examination in the lower court. And there was an attempt to raise a new point on appeal which, had it been taken at the trial, might have changed the course of the evidence given at trial and or which would require further factual inquiry. So all relevant factors have to be considered. I, I won't show it to your lordship now, but the Ali and Khatib case relied upon by MCM says... <coughs> having cited from the UK Supreme Court in the test claimants in FII group litigation. In the end, the task for the court is to make an evaluation of what justice requires in all the circumstances. So these principles on taking a point not taken below are substantially the same as those on withdrawing a concession, which are set out in the... Low and Matchell Joinery case, Authorities Bundle Tab 6, please. Page 109. The um, question was whether on appeal, a low was permitted to rely upon Section 14 of the Sale of Goods Act, which had been mentioned in Lowe's Beards. <coughs> but not pursued below. The majority allowed the point. Uh, quite a powerful dissent by Lord Justice Ricks. Yes, which went uh, mainly to the question of whether um, the, in substance the trial would have been conducted differently. Yep. And in the majority on page one, two, three, uh, Lord Justice Lloyd, with whom Mr Justice Lewison agreed, uh, referred to a number of authorities um, in paragraph 59, and in particular, towards the end of that paragraph, um, says, in Mullachy and Broad, as Lewison J says, the point which was open on the pleadings had been expressly disavowed by counsel in his opening at the trial and it was not allowed to be revived on appeal. In that case, I said this, a party who seeks to advance a different case in circumstances such as this plays a heavy burden as regards showing that the case could not have been conducted differently in any material respect as regards the evidence. Paragraph 60, by contrast, in Slack and Partners, the point sought to be raised on appeal had been taken in the pleadings and was abandoned at trial only in counsel's final submission so that it could not be said that this affected the evidence that the other party called at the trial, and the heavy burden of which I had spoken in the earlier case was discharged. Accordingly, I concluded that it was proper to allow the point to be taken on appeal, and the other members of the court agreed. Um, 
that summary of slack partners is closest to our fact pattern. But of course, each case turns on its own fact. Our written submissions on why this application should be allowed, uh, which obviously tie into the procedural chronology I set out um, before lunch, are in our application notice at Supplemental Bundle, tab 27, please. Page 180. There, Straits uh, gives the eight reasons why Straits should be allowed now to run the no lost point. It does so in particular in light of because in light of the size of the settlement figure and the judgment sum as it stands, uh, success on part one of what I've said this morning is not enough for straight survival. That we do say is relevant when the ultimate touchstone is what justice requires as per Ali and Khatib. The most important points are paragraphs 2 to 5 of these reasons. Building upon those, there are three points I want to emphasise or perhaps re-emphasise in light of some of the answers I've given already. First, because of the late disclosure of the unredacted settlement agreement, any point that the settlement agreement meant MCM had suffered no loss was not realistically one Straits could take until closing. Accordingly, MCM cannot say that Straits' failure to take the point in closing when Straits instead conceded the point in any way might have changed the course of the evidence given at trial. <clears throat> On the counterfactual, if Straits had taken the point in closing, it's uh, Mr Davies' oral reply where he would have been dealing with the point. And we've just looked at the transcript of that. At that stage, the lack of evidence on the settlement agreement and complexity were prayed in aid as a reason why the settlement agreement was raised in Tralius. Secondly, MCM protests that there will be a host of new factual inquiries and we say that's underpinned by a regret that MCM failed properly to bring forward an alternative claim based on the settlement agreement at trial. It failed to adduce any evidence as to the settlement agreement other than the redacted version until that Saturday before trial. In the face of the issues, in the case management list of issues and in the list of disclosure issues. If MCM wanted to reduce evidence on those factual inquiries it outlines in its skeleton at paragraphs 42 to 44, the time to do so was at trial in the face of those case management documents. Thirdly, it is equally irrelevant when MCM states that it may have wanted to amend the settlement agreement if the point had been taken earlier. It had every opportunity to amend the settlement agreement and to present properly its case prior to trial to block Straits from running the point and did not do so when it amended the settlement agreement earlier this year, it did not amend it to make MCM a co-payor of the relevant payment obligation. So in summary, MCM has not acted to its detriment 
by the point being pursued in detail only following the grant of permission to appeal. It's had the opportunity to make in its respondents skeleton submissions it could just on the counterfactual <coughs> have easily made in closing. It hasn't taken that opportunity but it's instead relied on its attempt to shut out the point. It has again focused on its primary position that this is all irrelevant. So for those reasons, we do say the court should grant permission to amend the grounds of appeal to allow ground 3D and then there to be a debate, some of which has been had already on the substance of the point as to um, no loss and the obligation falling on EDFM. For completeness, Straits has also applied for permission to appeal on ground 3D, which technically would be a precursor to debating the substance, on the basis that the judgment was wrong for the reasons given in our skeleton at paragraphs 36 to 43. So, um, with apologies that perhaps that ended up being back to front and that the application to argue the substance followed the argument of the substance, um, those are straight submissions on appeal unless there are any questions. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. Yes. <coughs> Mr. Davis. My Lords, um, subject to your wishes, I was actually going to deal with the matters in reverse order, i.e. dealing with the, the last point that Mr. Lewis has dealt with first, because um, logically, uh, I assume that that would be where he would have started with his application to amend the grounds of appeal. So I was going to deal with that new point first. Right, well, take, take your own course, that's fine. I'm grateful. Um, <clears throat> now, Lords, um, I'm grateful for the fact that they acknowledge on the other side that this is a new point. Uh, Mr. Lewis has acknowledged that in his supplemental skeleton. Um, he still appears to be arguing, um, although perhaps with some indications from uh, the bench, not with great force, that this was a point that was covered by his original grounds of appeal. <coughs> and no, you need trouble. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that, my lords. And just to pick up on one chronological issue, you're, I think my lord, Lord Justice Nugi asked Mr. Lewis if the permission to appeal skeleton was in the bundle. The answer is that there are two permission to appeal uh, skeletons in the bundle. There's the first one before Mr. Justice Calver, which is at tab uh, 25 of the supplemental bundle, which was the one I think Mr. Lewis referred your lordships to. Just to and one can only, one only needs to look briefly at page 169 to 171 to see that the, the new point that has now been run was not run before the learned judge when they saw the permission to do from him. And when the matter was before your Lordship, Lord Justice Mayles, that's at tab 26, the following tab. Except it's just described as an extract. It, it is, yes. So you, you're not given the benefit of the first 20 pages, well, first 19 or 20 pages, which dealt with the liability issues. And at page 175 and following is where ground three is dealt with, which is dealing with right. the yeah. residual actor point. And that was what Lord Justice Mayles had when gave permission to appeal in reference to the quantum element. Yeah, well, I think Mr Lewis accepted that yeah. this point wasn't there. In this yeah. case. I, and I was just showing you there for the, the, the chronology, my lords. Uh -huh. um, the, 
the other point I wanted to start with on this is the, the, the new point and the nature of it. Uh, because Mr. Lewis seems to be suggesting throughout his submission that it's uh, a point that we on this side should have effectively foreseen and pursued uh, an alternative and thereby pursued an alternative case on damages by reference to our supposed liability to ANZ up the line. And he says until we did that, it wasn't incumbent on him to plead a positive case, it seems, on damages. Now, th the reason I raise this is because it is the point that has been run against me now, although dressed up as a non-admission, because that's all that Straits ever did on their pleading, was not to admit our loss. Uh, what he is seeking to do now is a positive case. He is, uh, he's not just saying, well, you haven't proved your loss. And just as an aside there, my Lord, to say, well, we say we have, because our claim is pretty basic. We say we paid 284 million under these contracts with Plum Harvest Mega Wealth, paid it over, we got nothing in return. We have proved our loss. If he wants to say, well, no, you haven't suffered a loss, either because you've entered into a settlement agreement with ANZ for a lower figure, or because you've entered into a, an agreement with your parent company, and you then both enter into a settlement agreement with ANZ, and your parent company agrees to take on the liability that you would otherwise have, that, with all due respect, is a positive case that my learned friend should have pleaded, uh, or at least given us notice that he was going to take, and run a trial. We say it's not right to say that you can hide behind uh, a plea of non-admission of loss and then on appeal seek to argue what my learned friend is seeking to do right now. And if I could just ask you to dip very briefly at this stage in the authorities bundle at tab uh, 7. <clears throat> and this is the OMB Petron case, which your lordships have already been taken to, and I think we will probably return to uh, at a later stage in my submission. But um, if I could ask your lordships to go to page 148 of this bundle. And paragraph 47, where Lord Justice Christopher Clark is dealing with Glencore's criticisms of the assessment and evaluation approach. <coughs> At the bottom of the page, 148, his lordship says, Fourth, it's not apparent that there were no deleterious consequences as a result of the use of the blends. If Glencore sought to contend that action taken post-breach reduced Petron's recoverable loss, it was for it to plead and prove it. Uh, and then he goes on to say, the pleadings made no averment to what happened at the refinery. Now, well, I'm not taking a pleading point, my lords, but I am taking a point that this is a positive case, which, if it had been raised uh, below, would have been dealt with by my clients, and we say may well have been the subject of further, certainly would have been the subject of further inquiry, but it may well have been the subject of evidence from this side regarding the relationship between my client MCM and its parent company, and the circumstances in which the parent company came to agree to clause 4.1 in the settlement agreement. Now, the, the oh, well, presumably because nobody takes on obligations they don't have to because that's what ANZ demanded. That would be my inference. <clears throat> well, my lord, I'm, I'm going to come back to the effect of that at, at the end, if I may. But, but it, it may it opens up the issue. Of, well, who is a have have MCM? basically have their liability 
covered by that parent and pay for them. Is there a relationship between MCM and the parent company to offset that liability in some way or another? That, that is what I'm talking about. There would, would have been mm -hmm. evidence about that. But this relationship, uh, and it may be I'm straying away from the application itself, but this, this relationship is something further removed from the underlying fraud which has caused us to enter into the original contract with Plum Harvest and Megawell. What MCM and the parent company agree between themselves is not caused at all, certainly not legally caused. Or it is factually caused. It, but for, it, my lord, your lordship is quite right, without us This is all trying to sort out the consequences of the fraud. Correct, my lord, correct. But it, it's not legally caused by the fraud. It, it, but for the fraud, we never would have done it, but that, that's a truism. But, but, even if my learner friend is right that my parent company has said, don't worry, MCM, we've got your back covered, we're going to pay this liability to you, why is that not a gift? Why is that not in the nature of precisely the sort of transaction that is raising terrarius acta as stipulated by Lord Sumption and Swinson. It's the classic situation. Yeah, it's a slightly different analysis because the gift point is that if you suffered a loss and someone gives you money, you don't have to account for it. Um, but that's that's where it's the argument you're facing is you have to bring this in, into account. The argument you're facing is a different one, which is that under the settlement agreement, MCM by, is released by ANZ of all liability. That's not a gift by <coughs> ANZ. Well, I think my, my learned friend's point is that the, the, the liability has been paid for by my parent company. He doesn't, he and, doesn't, care, who, he doesn't care who pays for it. His point is that MCM doesn't have to pay anything. Yes, but, the, but, but I don't, my lord, with respect, I don't see why that's not in the nature of a gift. If somebody assumes a liability on your behalf, why is that not in the nature of somebody saying, well, don't worry, I will... They, they could have given us the money for us, MCM, to make the payment. There's no difference. But that, that's... I've sort of moved off. In a, in a sense, that would be an answer to it. If, if this was a true permission to appeal application, assume that my own friend had put this in his permission to appeal skeleton for your lordship, and we had responded, and we would have said, well, you can't raise it for the reasons we've already raised, but in any event, you don't get over the threshold of having an arguable case on this, because it can't be a it is, an, it is obviously a res inter amis act a point as between MCM and its parent company. That's got nothing to do with the underlying fraud uh, in terms of legal causation. But if I can return to the chronology and just make a few observations uh, on that, if I may. Uh, and we start with the redacted version of the skeleton. And you will have picked up, my lords, no doubt, in our skeleton, we gave you the date on which that was disclosed to all the defendants. It was disclosed on the 30th of October 2020, i.e. a year before trial. And uh, my learned friend has taken you to some correspondence uh, from September that began in September 2011, i.e. virtually in the, the three weeks before trial. That is the first time that any of the defendants asked for an unredacted version of the settlement agreement. So they've had this document for almost a year, some of the defendants have taken the point by reference to the settlement agreement saying, oh, well, your liability 
uh, oh sorry, our liability to indemnify you, even if you're right, is going to be referable to whatever you've got to pay under the settlement agreement. We take issue with that. Straits never took that point on the pleading. They ran it at trial, and we didn't take any pleading point on it because it was, as Mr. Lewis has rightly said, an issue raised by the other defendant. But none of the defendants took the new point that is now before your Lordship. And I can make the obvious points, but looking at what your Lordships have been shown, it is quite clear from even the redacted version that it wasn't just my client MCM that was a party to that uh, settlement agreement, it was also its parent company identified as such. And your Lordships have well in mind what Clause 41A says. Admittedly, it does not have the figure appended to it, but the issue is there in black and white. And the distinction between MCM and EDFM is quite apparent when one reads just through the recitals pages 23 to 24 of that redacted settlement agreement. And indeed, it, it goes on throughout, and the distinction is again drawn, as, as your Lordships have seen in Clause 10, where it's MCM is to use its best endeavours to pursue the recovery of the relevant amounts. It's not EDFM that has that obligation. And that's page 28. Why was it so heavily redacted? Um, my Lord, I cannot answer that question uh, at this present time, save other than to say that uh, my clients were of the view that it contained overly sensitive information and did not wish that to be divulged uh, unless they were required to do so. Uh, the issue never became an issue until requested in September of 2021. Um, and as you will have seen, ultimately, the unredacted version, subject to the figure, was made available, and even the figure was then conveyed. Uh, but I'm not sure the reason beyond that would necessarily assist. I mean, it is true, but it is extraordinarily difficult to construe a document if you don't see the whole of the relevant parts of the document. Well, Lord, I, I, I don't say other than your Lordship is correct on that observation, but in terms of who is the payer, we would submit it is quite clear from that document who that, on the face of it, is to be. If anything, with all the redactions, it makes it simpler, we would say, to, to see what is being done in relation to the payment amounts. Now, my lords, you have been taken to the um, list of issues for disclosure and the list of issues for trial. I'm not going to go back to that. Um, but what I did want to do was to briefly show you uh, the defence, the re reamended defence again, if I may, <coughs> which, if I could ask you to take up the core bundle. Because all, all it shows is it's, an, it's the non-admission there. I don't need to show you that. I beg your pardon, my lord. But if, what I would like to do is to show you the opening submissions, not the um, pleading, because it's in the opening submissions that we see the understanding that they have on the other side with regard to this particular point. And that's in the supplemental bundle. I, did, I beg your pardon. Tab 14. Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> All I would say in relation to the defence is that it was amended after they had uh, received the redacted version of the settlement agreement. Now, if we look at tab 14, page uh, 9091, this is the written opening submissions from uh, Straits. And you'll see at 142, they say the factual position is as follows. Um, and then we've got MCM Skeleton confirms that those warehouse receipts uh, for which MCM paid were all sold on by MCM to a ANZT. Uh, settlement agreement between MCM and ANZ initially entered on the 7th of February 2017, later amended. And it records the recital. So the ANZ suffered that loss of 291 million. MCM has so far only disclosed the redacted version of that agreement. Recital B records X. Recital E records that MCM does not accept liability. Clause 3 1 contains a mutual release. And then, my lords, the relevant bit. Pursuant to Clause 4 1, that release was in consideration for MCM agreeing to pay ANZ the payment amount, yet the amount MCM agreed to pay has been unjustifiably redacted. Now, the point I'm making there, my lords, is that they are reading EDFM as MCM. That's their choice. That, on the face of that document, carries with it a clear concession, we would say, as had their pleading, beforehand, that they were not taking a point on the fact that it's EDFM that is the payer under the settlement agreement. And, my lords, that was the basis upon which the trial was conducted, uh, and uh, that was the issue which MCM, as you've seen uh, in that section on one paragraph 140 and onwards, that we went to trial to meet in terms of evidence. There was no suggestion at any stage that this point was being taken, hence there was no evidence on it. <clears throat> now, Mr Lewis says, I think, that this was before disclosure of the unredacted version, but you say... Um, well, I had the redacted version, which ought to have put them on notice of it, and uh, even if it didn't, uh, they, they could have made the point at some early stage in the course of the trial if the redacted version had caused the um, penny to drop. Yes, my lord, of course, yes. I mean, that's your point, though, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and, it, and they, they could have asked for the unredacted version of the settlement agreement much sooner than they did, not wait nearly a year Brings me on to my the next point, my lord, uh, and that is the reason given for raising this particular point at this stage and not at the trial. Now, well, you, you have my point that they could and should have raised it at trial, but what is now said as to why it's been raised now? Because it's never said that we were not aware of this point. There's no, there's no evidence before your lordships to say uh, uh, from straits, oh, well, we, we didn't spot this point at all. The inference that has to be drawn is that they were aware of it, but chose not to run this point. And in a way, there's what Mr Dinsmore said in closing was the, the words I think he used to his lordship, Lord, Lord Jeff, Mr Justice Calvin were, uh, as your Lordship is aware, we're not taking this point about who the payer is. Well, that's rather hard to square with the idea that they were aware of a point and saving it for a time when it would be too late for you to do anything about it. Well, well, let, my Lords, let's see how uh, the reason for it being taken now, and if we could go to um, their skeleton argument, please, in the appeal bundle. At tab three. 
<coughs> and if the point that's reflected in the notice of application of paragraph one, page 34, my lords, paragraph 39. very top, they said, however, given the existential threat to Straits now posed by the judgment, currently subject to a stay, Straits wishes hereby to withdraw the concession and to argue that MCM has not proven any loss. Uh, in circumstances where the payment obligation under the settlement agreement fell not upon MCM, but upon its parent company, EDFM. Now, it's the reason for raising it now is the existential threat to Straits. But that was a threat that was always present. I accept that during the course of the trial, one doesn't know what you're going to end up with at trial, but the threat was always there, that they were going to lose that trial, as they have done so. And with all due respect, nothing else has come to light to suggest there's a reason why they didn't appreciate it at trial so they couldn't have run it. The reason they didn't run it at trial, with all due respect, is probably because it's a bad point. And they're now trying to run this point because they know that there's a real problem for straight, so they say, if they have to try and meet the judgment that has now been handed down. And I do make the point that a party cannot wait until they lose at trial and then decide to take a point on appeal after they've had the full trial and seen, oh, it hasn't gone as we hoped it would go. Well, let's try and run this new point now to see if that gets some traction. That's not uh, an appropriate way to conduct litigation with respect. That was the appropriate test for your lordships to apply. Um, I have no quibble with Mr. Lewis's submissions that he's made in relation to that. Obviously, the Notting Hill case uh, speaks for itself. But there is an important point to bear in mind that comes through the Notting Hill decision uh, uh, and the Ali Khatib case, which is adopts the FII case, that your lordships are looking at what might have happened at trial. Not what would have happened. It's what could have happened, what might have happened. That's how your lordships should uh, view the matter. <coughs> and it's in light of that that you are uh, given a spectrum of situations. In, in every case, there is the the situation at which we say we are at, where you've had a full trial, you've had live evidence, you have an issue that we say could have been raised, had they chosen to raise it at trial, and we say it might have given rise to different evidence, different arguments, if this point had been taken. And in a sense, we have that a little bit this morning, because uh, even this afternoon, I think, when Mr. Lewis was taking your lordships to the settlement agreement. And he's right to say, in a way, that at trial before Mr. Justice Calver, we were content, in a sense, with having our... Our primary case was the 284 million. And we said... You can ignore the settlement agreement. It's got nothing to do with your Lordship's assessment of loss in this case. But if you're not with us um, on that, for whatever reason, then um, we would be content with the alternative fallback of the Delta figure. Now, that's a rather different scenario, though, if you put into the mix that my learned friend is taking a further point saying, uh, well, no, the settlement agreement is relevant, but also is the fact that your parent company, 
is actually paying the delta figure. <coughs> Ergo, you have suffered no loss. Now, if that point had been taken, I suspect we would have taken a rather different view of how we dealt with the settlement agreement, both in terms of our arguments under it and the evidence that we could have called to explain how it came into being and what the relationship, as I've said before, uh, was as between MCM and its parent company. In other words, we, we say, unlike my learned friend who says on that spectrum that you get um, in the Notting Hill case, he says, well, we're down at the, the bottom. We're in a situation almost of a pure point of law, which your lordships can simply deal with. You can accept this point going through. We say, I'm, I'm sorry, we're at the other end of that spectrum. And we would say that your lordship should not permit this point uh, to be argued before your lordships. And their notice of application... Uh, to run this point should be uh, dismissed. So, my lords, that was subject to your lordship. That's all I had to say on the, the application. Mm -hmm. and I was going to turn next to the what I regard, I regard as the main grounds of appeal, yeah. if that's convenient. <clears throat> can I ask your lordship what time are your, are your lordships seeking to rise, just so I can... Uh, well, we generally rise at 4.15, and I don't see any reason to do differently. I'm not, I'm not suggesting otherwise. Um, now, my lords, the assessment of damages. The context of a claim is critical when it comes to the assessment of damages. My learned friend pray, seeks to pray and aid what Lord, just, Lord Stain said in um, the... Uh, um, the Smith New Court decision saying, oh, well, there's this overriding rubric that one should apply. I don't, I don't deny that you're dealing with compensatory rules, but the context of a particular claim is very important, especially when you come to try to apply general observations or general principles on the issue of res inter alias acta that are taken from the observations, for example, of Lord Sumption in the Swinson case. Because that, the Swinson case is something very different to what we're dealing with here in terms of the nature of the claim and the Tiuta case. We are dealing with the principles that apply or referable to the tort of deceit, and I think Mr Lewis accepts that. And it's the tort of deceit that is the unlawfulness that underlies the tort of unlawful means conspiracy in this case. And so it's the principles referable to the tort of deceit that are our start point. But be before I come to those principles, I just want to ask your Lordship to bear four factors in mind. And the first is that in the context of the claim against Straits, uh, your Lordship's decision will have the same impact as it would do for the claims against the first four defendants, i.e. the central figures in the fraud, as Mr Lewis, I think, describes them. Those people who were responsible for deceiving my client for entering into the contract with Come Harvest and Megawell. Which you, you say it would have the same consequences. They've not appealed. No. So they're stuck with the judgment below, whatever we decide. They are, my lord. But so, um, so this is just this is not a practical point. It's a forensic point. That it's a forensic point, my lord. In the sense, yes, that's what. But I'm it asking. would apply to fraudsters themselves. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> um, the second point um, to bear in mind, and I'll just ask you generally to again another forensic point, is to bear in mind the findings of dishonesty that have been made not just against the, the central figure but against Mr. Lewis's client, straight. <coughs> and I can just, I'm not going to spend time reading the relevant paragraphs, but I'll give your lordships the references, if I may. Paragraphs 409 to 412, 
and paragraphs 529 to 532 of the judgment, all um, in tab 8 of your appeal bundle, that this is a case involving serious allegations of fraud that have been proven. The third point I ask you to bear in mind, it's something we're going to come back to as well, is that there is a policy issue in play in the context of a deceit claim. Because firstly, the court is focusing on compensating the innocent victim for all of the direct loss that victim has suffered. Secondly, ensuring that fraudsters do not profit uh, from their fraudulent conduct. And thirdly, in cases of doubt, the court is always going to favour the interests of the innocent victim over those of the fraudster. And the reason I stress that point, my Lord, is that the fourth point I want to make, overarching point, is that if Mr Lewis's analysis is correct in this case, it means that the fraudsters would be entitled to keep on the face of it and walk away with the difference between the amount they stole from my client, MCN, which was $284 million, and the payment amount under the settlement agreement. Maybe I should explain that because at the moment, Mr. Lewis says, oh, you're only entitled, MCN, despite having paid the fraudsters $284 million, you're only entitled to recover the delta figure for which you settled your claim, or you settled the claim against you up the line with um, ANZ. What's to happen to the, the remainder? Why can't ANZ sue, sue the fraudsters for it? Well, that, that maybe, but well, maybe they don't. Maybe they, do. I don't know, is, what, is the answer to that, my lord. But on the basis of my claim against the fraudsters, the position is that they get to walk away with X million dollars at the moment. That would be the, the case you're facing is that, is that the, the 284 million you paid over all came from ANZ, and it's really ANZ who, who's lost the money. So. The, the deal you do with ANZ, if you're only paying them the delta figure, it's they who are out of pocket to the tune of the difference between 291 and the delta figure. And that's their claim, it's not yours. Well, I, understand, I, I understand that, but the fact of the matter is that um, the, whole, the, the nature of the tort here uh, is such that it's uh, induced my client to enter into these contracts with Come Harvest and Megawatt. I think, uh, I think we all understand that. Yeah. We all understand that you paid 284 million, and at the time you paid it, it was your money. Yes. But that doesn't really deal with the point you're facing, which is what have you really lost from the. If you'd never gone into this at all, you wouldn't have had the 7 million profit, you wouldn't have had a liability to ANZ, you wouldn't have had these worthless bits of paper. But to put you back in the position you would have been in if you'd never gone into this at all, um, then. All you have to do is compensate you for, for what you are out of pocket at the end of the day. And if all you have to do is pay the delta figure, or indeed nothing, but the parent pays it, you're not out of pocket. That's that's. I'm not saying that's right, but that's the case you're facing. No, no, no. I, I understand that. And my since, Lord. since torts are about compensating for loss, they're not about stripping fraudsters of profits. There are other claims which can be used to strip fraudsters of profits, but not this one. Then, uh, then what we have to concentrate on is what have you really lost? But, my Lord, you, well, I, I understand that, but you have to apply proper principles to get to the, the conclusion as to what have I lost. Now, in the context of a tort, deceit claim, tort of deceit claim, you look at, you start off by looking at what have you been induced to do by reason of the tort. Now, as between the fraudsters, I've been induced to enter into a contract with Come Harvest and Megawell. I understand where the money's come from. But, and so, prima facie, I, I am paying over $284 million 
and I get nothing in return because all I get is the fourth warehouse receipt. So on ordinary principles, applying the Smith New Court case, applying OMV and Petron, my loss is the amount of money I've paid over less the benefit I have received on those transactions. That's the, the standard measure of loss, prima facie loss. And we receive nothing in return for the 284 million. So that is where you're starting from. It may be that I've entered into a sub-sale or a financing arrangement. It could be a bank to obtain the monies by which to pay down the line to come harvest mega wealth. But when those monies arrive in my account, they are my monies. And those are the monies I've paid over, and I'm, I'm out of pocket on those monies. I may have a liability up the line now to ANZ because I've been given forged warehouse receipts, and I pass those forged warehouse receipts up the line to ANZ. And I may well face a liability of 291 million up the line. <clears throat> the difference, the seven million dollars, is a, a consequential loss of me having entered into those fraudulently induced contracts with Come Harvest Mega Wealth. And this is the key point to understanding with respect to this, my lords, is that that element is, that's the consequential element of my loss. And on the face of it, it would be two, $7 million. I could claim that as extra. And that's why we pleaded originally, well, actually we always pleaded, we just didn't then pursue it, but we pleaded our basic loss, the 284, plus the consequential loss we would suffer as a result of our liability to ANZ. Now that is perfectly, the perfectly proper way of doing it. Now the reason why the, the settlement agreement is relevant or comes into play is because it potentially takes out that consequential loss claim. Because I can't, just for sake of argument, assume we settle with ANZ for a figure lower than I don't know, $250 million or something. So I can't turn around and say to um, Straits or the fraudsters, Oh, I've actually suffered a consequential loss because I haven't now because I've that position has been effectively mitigated. I'm being very stupid. I'm sorry. It's probably the time of day, but I haven't understood in what circumstances you could claim the seven million as consequential loss. The, well, um, well, we would say. Suppose that, you hadn't settled at all. What do I mean? Suppose you hadn't settled with A and Z. Suppose ANZ had asked for its 291 million back and you'd given them the 291 million back. Are you saying you could claim 291 million from the fraudsters? No, I, I am saying that we, because we're claiming the 284 yes. as our loss, and I'm liable to ANZ for the 291, if I'm going to make good the 291, assume they pay me back my 284, I'm out of, I've still got to pay. A and Z, the, the, the difference. You've got to pay them 291, but you've had 291 from them, didn't you? Well, my lord, it, it, it may well be that that would be an answer to a, a, a consequential loss claim. I'm using this as this saying why that, if there is a claim over against A and Z, so, if there is a claim by A and Z against me, that would be where a consequential loss claim would come in.
And that's where... But, but it wouldn't, as my Lord says. It simply not suffered that loss. You're only, you're only paying them back the money that they've given you. And that um, puts you, if you get your 284 back, that puts you back in the position as if none of this had ever happened. And then, um, and that's the measure in tort. As, dist as distinct from co uh, contract, where you do well, get your bargain. My, my you can, say, you can hardly say that um, the settlement agreement is a mitigation of a consequential loss claim if the consequential loss claim doesn't exist in the first place. Well, it may be that there is a defence to the consequential loss claim. You, your logic may well be right on that, but the, but that's not to set, that does not does not create. Come back to my lord's point that does not create this transaction. That I've been induced to enter into with Tom Harvey and Megaware into a transaction whereby I uh, uh, basically MCM is taken out of the picture, and that it, the liability is effectively the li liability, or the MCM Tom Harvey's contract is taken out of the picture, and the liability is the one up the line. The your lordship was saying to me earlier, well, the, the, the party that's really suffered the loss here is ANZ. But ANZ may have suffered an additional, or may have an additional claim in tort. That's a matter for ANZ. But we have a claim in tort for what we have paid over. And the reason why the, um, it's important to bear in mind the different entities involved and the different transactions involved, which is precisely how my Lord or Mr. Lord, um, Lord, Mr. Justice Calvert dealt with it below. Because the analysis that your Lordship was putting to me was basically running roughshod over the separate transactions that existed in this case. And it's a point that Lord Sumption himself makes in the Swinson case. And we'll, it may be worthwhile having a quick look at that now to, to make the point good that I am making to your Lordship's um, do I understand the way you'd be putting it as this? You, you do have a liability for the ANZ 291 million because although that's what you were paid, it was for worthless bits of paper, and therefore they have a claim for that money back or the equivalent amount back, whether yes. that's a restitution claim or a contractual claim. But you don't put that as your primary measure of loss because you say your primary loss is the amount you paid away, namely 284 million. And it's only the additional liability of the 291, which you owe to ANZ, which is claimed by way of additional consequential loss as, as a liability claim. And that's where you get your 7 million from. Yes. Is that, is yes. that, is that, that how you put how, it? That's how I was putting it. Yes, sir. And what, what, it's, what it is showing here is that you, you have separate claims between separate entities based on the transactions that they've each entered into. <coughs> and I want, if I could ask you to look at the Swinson case. It's slightly going out of uh, the order in which I wanted to take this, but um, uh, I appreciate the point that my Lord Lord Justice Nugent is putting to me, and I think I should have just meet it head on. And you'll find that, my Lord, with tab 8 of the authority. And I'm going to come to, if I could ask you to start at page 164, which is in the argument of um, Q Sim, Q Sims QC uh, on behalf of the claimant respondent to begin with. And at the very bottom of the page, the last two lines, he said, his submission was, as to the issue of collateral benefits, the judge was entitled when addressing the question of whether the loan repayment 
should be disregarded, to view that as part of a wider refinancing transaction, driven by real losses already then suffered by the claimant. In assessing whether a gain should be taken into account, legal causation principles are relevant and should be determinative in favour of rejection of the appeal. So if the argument was being put similar to that which we have here, I would don't look at the narrow transactions, we have to look at the wider transactions. <clears throat> and if we could please just then pick it up uh, where my learned friend took you this morning, to paragraph 11 at page 168, and over the page to 169, where his lordship is talking in general terms uh, with regard to uh, collateral payments. And he begins, to this there is an exception for collateral payments, which the law treats as not making good the claimant's loss. Difficult to identify a single principle. In spite of what the Latin tag might lead one to expect, the critical factor is not the source of the benefit, uh, but its character. And just pausing there, the character is important, because here you've got separate transactions, separate contracts. That's the character we're talking about. Broadly speaking, collateral benefits are those whose receipt are, arose independently of the circumstances giving rise to the loss. And so there's a debate there, well, what does independently mean? How broad is that going to be construed? Thus, a gift received by the claimant even if occasioned by his loss is regarded as independent of the loss because its gratuitous character means uh, that there is no causal relationship between them. So that, my Lord, is the point I was making earlier about uh, the parent company assuming a liability for MCM in this case. That's, that would cover that situation. The same is true of a benefit received by right from a third party in respect of the loss, but for which the claimant has given a consideration independent of the legal relationship with the defendant from which the loss arose. Now, why uh, in this instance, I ask, does that not encapsulate the subsales that we're talking about here between my client and ANZ? They are separate transactions with uh, their consideration which is independent of the legal relationship uh, with the defendant, i.e. come harvest, mega wealth, or straits from which the loss arose. And then, if I could ask your lordships to drop down to paragraph 30. <clears throat> it says, if in December 2008, Mr. Hunt had lent the money to Swinson to strengthen its financial position in the light of EMSL's default, the payment would have indeed have had no effect on the damages recoverable from HMT. The payment would not have discharged EMSL's debt. It would also have been collateral but the payments made by Mr. Hunt to EMSL and by EMSL to Swinson to pay off those loans could not possibly be regarded as collateral. In the first place, the transaction discharged the very liability whose existence represented Swinson's loss. And then secondly, money which Hunt lent to EMSL was not an indirect payment to Swinson, even though it ultimately reached them as the terms of the loan required. Mr. Hunt's agreement to make the, that loan and the earlier agreements of Swinson to lend money to EMSL were distinct transactions between different parties, each of which was made for valuable consideration in the form of the respective covenant to repay. And his lordship is making that quite clear that you cannot ride roughshod over the distinct entities involved in this case, and the distinct transactions that have been entered into. And that was Mr. Justice Calver's uh, point in this case, 
and with respect he's quite right about it and M Mr Lewis is wrong to say oh well he's given too much credence to the fact that you actually have separate transactions here that's at the heart of this case with respect they are not mere technicalities as Mr Lewis uh, would have us think <clears throat> and my lords um, well, we, we say that the Swinson case gives you the answer the, the, the bit I read to your lordships in paragraph 11 uh, between B and C it is simply um, clear in what it says and applies uh, with equal with force to the separate transactions we have in this particular case. But isn't, now, but isn't that um, passage giving a reason why they are not regarded as collateral? In in thirteen. Yes. Yes, it is, my lord. Although it's um, it is, but it's. Um, the same principle applies. I mean, he's, he's saying you can't just um, you can't look at the matter globally to look at well, what is the general commercial outcome here to avoid the problem that these are separate transactions. So that um, sorry, no, but the, well, he's making the point where you've paid off the very liability. That, I mean, that's why that, that's not really a resident alias act for point because the, the liability has been paid off, so the it doesn't arise. But the principle. Well, I don't know, it may be a terminological point, but uh, at the top of page 169, the assumption seems to treat collateral as a uh, synonym for resident alias act. And now he's giving reasons in paragraph 13 as to why the payments are not collateral, are not breathing in trade it, sector. Um, well, so in. I'm missing something. Broad assumptions, blind. Is well, that the loss for which the claimant was suing was the loss of having lent the money? To the company which wasn't worth what the value was said it was worth. And that loss has ceased to exist because Swenson, as a, as a separate entity, has been repaid yes. the money. The fact that the route by which it got repaid was Mr. Hunt putting his hands into his own pocket and lending the money to the company which then used it to repay Swenson is neither here nor there. The fact is, it no longer had a loss. No, no, I fully accept that, my lord. Yes, that, that's quite. That's why I've said it's not really a res inter alias act of point in relation to that, because the, the loss has just been paid off, the liability ceased to exist. And the, the second point um, was dealing with the um, well, it's just dealing with the, the argument that the. the, the there's some sort of indirect payment to Swinson via Mr. Hunt. I mean, just he, the point that, Mr. that Lord Sumption is making is that you cannot ignore the legal realities in any situation, whichever way you are looking at it, whether it's to say this is a collateral benefit or it's not a collateral benefit. The point is that you do not ride roughshod over the distinct transactions between different parties. each of which has been made for valuable consideration. And I wonder if I might um, take the, the Tuta case, which is relied upon by my learned friends as well, doesn't really take matters any further than citing what Lord Sumption said in the Swinson case. <coughs> but I would like to show your lordships before we rise, if I may, the Alliance case, which uh, was relied upon uh, 
in my learned friend's skeleton. And this one can find at tab 15 of the bundle of authorities. And this is a claim by your lordships may or may not be aware of this, but it, it, it probably are aware of it. Um, the permission to appeal was granted by my Lord Lord Justice Males uh, some way back. But it, it's a claim by 170 plus claimant funds, uh, investment funds, for damages against <coughs> banks for illegal and anti competitive manipulation of the Forex markets, basically. Um, and there's a an argument based upon reflective loss, which doesn't concern us. Um, but the second line of defence, which your Lordships can pick up, is at paragraph 3 on page 346, uh, which is that the banks denied liability and further assert that the funds have avoided or passed on losses incurred as a result of the alleged infringements to the extent the investors in the funds have subsequently redeemed or withdrawn their investment at an NAV, which is lower than it would have been but for the alleged infringements. So what is being said is effectively that the, the funds have had a benefit because those investors who have redeemed their investment have done so at a lower NAV. So it's said that the funds have benefited. And this was a strikeout uh, by the, the claimants to prevent that argument going forward because it was going to lead to a massive amount of disclosure and major issues if it were allowed to. And they were successful uh, in the strikeout. And I wonder if I could ask your lordships um, to pick it up uh, at page 353 and this is under the, the relevance of the plea of avoided loss and 24 his lordship this is lord justice Phillips says the true question is whether the funds have avoided or mitigated their loss by reason of redemption so that the amount recoverable by them is reduced the question of reflective loss does not arise because and then he goes on to deal with that and um, if i can take your lordship to um, 32 after going through Swinson up page 356, <clears throat> his lordship says at 32 on page 356, the question is therefore whether the benefit is to be regarded as arising independently of the loss, even if occasioned by it. So that, that's making the point for lords that it's, it's not just a but for question. A benefit derived from a separate transaction for which the claimant has given consideration, and we would say like the subsales here, or a gift made because of the loss, are both likely to be regarded as collateral being tantamount to making good the loss from the claimant's own resources. And if we could go over to page 357, please, application of the principles in the present case. You see, 36, the banks, paragraph 36, 357, the banks contend that the benefit of lower redemptions is not collateral to the fund's losses because it arises directly from the alleged wrongdoing being, in effect, the passing on to the investor of the loss suffered by the funds. However, the matters relied on by the banks demonstrate little more than that any benefit to the funds in lower redemption values was occasioned by the alleged wrongdoing just as an insurance payment or gift intended to help repair damage. As emphasised in Swinson, it's necessary to consider the nature of the transaction which gave rise to the benefit to determine if it's be regarded as arising independently of the fund's loss. The banks have focused on the benefit, not the transactions, which give rise to it. In my judgment, redemptions and any benefit the funds derive from are independent of the fund's losses for the following reasons. And my Lord's just pausing there. 
we would say this applies equally to our situation when you have regard to the transactions which give rise to the situation. And in particular, what is the benefit that we receive vis-a-vis ANZ uh, um, up the line that is other than occasioned by entering into the contract with Plum Harvest and Mega Wealth? We don't receive a benefit from ANZ if we are receiving monies from them which comes with an equal and opposite liability to repay. There's no benefit there. The benefit to my clients in relation to the ANZ contracts only arises now happenstance because of the settlement agreement. <clears throat> but before we get to the settlement agreement, that like the relationships between the fund and the investors, in this case, in the Allianz case, those are independent transactions. So is the transaction between my client, MCM, and ANZ. Because <clears throat> it's at, at number one, redemptions will usually occur pursuant to on the terms of contracts between the funds and their investors embodied in the trustees' articles or partnership deeds uh, which govern the relationship between them. Those contracts pre-existed the wrongdoings and their formation and the exercise of the rights they're under are entirely independent of the wrongdoing. And it goes on again to say that, that they are independent, contract, uh, independent contracts. Now in this instance, <clears throat> whilst the um, agreement, the master agreement between my client MCM and ANZ predated the frauds in this case. And so the individual contracts made under that, uh, but the individual contracts made under that obviously were at the time of the fraud. But the master agreement predated it, but they are still separate and independent uh, contracts. And at little four, if we could just drop down to there, the bank's argument is thus, in reality, a negation of the corporate entity doctrine treating losses as suffered by the ultimate investors rather than by the entity which has been established as the vehicle for the investment. Now that's not a million miles from what um, Mr Lewis is suggesting in this case. Well, the loss is really suffered by ANZ here and you're just the conduit MCM. And maybe it's not negating the corporate entity, but it is negating the existence of separate contracts between separate entities. <clears throat> and then at 38, to the extent that it is appropriate... I think Mr. Mr. Lewis's point is that separate contracts is not the be-all and end-all of it, and that you've got to look at the transaction. And he says when you look at the transaction here, this, this was structured in a particular way so that the two contracts were always intended to work together. And everybody knew that was what was intended. And, uh, your, your client was essentially acting as a middleman um, from the PMA letter that was addressed to ANZ and all, all the rest of the factors which he relied on this morning. Um, so the question is whether it is, whether these are to be regarded as separate well, transactions or as a single composite well, 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 Lord, I, I understand the point and I understand the argument, but with respect, I say, well, that, that is effectively to negate the existence of separate contracts and separate transactions between separate entities. We may well be in the middle, but we are a principle. This is a principle to principle to principle situation. We're not, a, we're not acting as a, a broker or an agent. We are acting as a principle assuming obligations both up and down the line as a principle. Is it a question of analysing what the fraud caused to happen? You start your submissions and I think put at the forefront of them that what the fraud caused to happen was MCM entering into the contracts with TH and MW. Uh, but I think what's put against you 
is that what the fraud caused to happen was for both sets of contracts to be put in place <coughs> together as part of a package, so that it's not a case of the fraud causing the MCM contracts with CH-MW, which formed the occasion for, to adopt this language, the contracts with ANZ. It's, uh, it's not one as a consequence or occasioned by the other. It's two as part and parcel of the same result of the fraud, and that the existence of <coughs> two separate contractual relationships can't define whether they are one or both to be treated as a result of the fraud. As I, as I say, that's really the, the, the gravamen of the point. Not, not I, 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 and I don't disagree with that, but, it, it, but it, you're right to say it comes back to well, what, was, what were we being induced to do? We were being induced to enter into the contracts with Come Harvest Megawell, CHMW. They didn't give a fig about how we were getting the money to pay them. Part of their, 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 their deceit was to get the contract from us. Whether we went to ANZ or another financier or bank to get the money, that was not what they were looking to induce. That, well, I appreciate that that's what happened. I mean, I, don't, I can't get around from that being the, the case. Um, but in the start point has to be that it is my money that they've taken. Um, and if I have a claim against the fraudsters for the money they've taken, why should it be limited to a figure less than the amount I paid over. That's something that um, we say is difficult to explain in this situation. Right. Is that a convenient moment for today? My Lord, it, it probably is a convenient moment. And uh, how much uh, uh, tomorrow morning do you think well, we'll need? Well, I've, I've sort of... Um, I've just some quite a bit of what I was going to say by way of it. I'm going to have to revisit and just see if I need to go back at the start. I think your lordships already have where I'm coming from, as, as Justice Popperwell has, has indicated. Uh, and I don't wish to just repeat everything that we've said in our skeleton. So I would be done um, certainly within the hour. And maybe. Very good. All right, 10.30 then. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, my lord, I, I beg your pardon. Ah. Uh, I'm told that there are some files with um, the sample documents of oh, the master nice. agreements, the contracts. Now, I don't know if your lordships want them. So I haven't actually looked at them. I don't know if people on the other side have. They've been okayed by those behind me. Uh, I don't know what's in there, but uh, <laughs> your lordships are welcome to have. If are you, you happy for us to have them now, Mr. Lewis? I am. All right. Well, if there's, any, if there's any problem about what's in there or if anything needs to be added, then you can sort that out between yourselves and uh, we'll deal with it in the morning. I'm grateful. Thank you very much.